Good morning, everybody. How are you? I wasn't very enthusiastic. Is it the rain? Good morning. Thank you very much. You know, in Mexico, if you don't respond with a good buenos dias, it's considered an insult. So, uh, um, yeah, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm very, very glad you're here. I'm going to begin with something which sounds a little bit off topic, and it is totally off topic, but it's something that matters to me. Um, one of the greatest footballers in the world died today, Gordon Banks. He was the England goalkeeper in the 1966 World Cup winning team. And the connection with Mexico is a little bit spurious, but I'm going to mention it anyway. He performed what was perhaps the greatest save in history at the 1970 World Cup in Mexico at the Azteca Stadium when Pele directed a downward header into the bottom left-hand corner of his net and somehow, miraculously, Gordon Banks got down and saved it. It is universally, by English people, recognized <laughs> as the greatest save of all time. So I'm thinking about Gordon Banks today. Thank you very much. Um, he was a terrific chap and uh, we'll, we'll miss him dearly. Um, this is our annual event on security and the rule of law in Mexico. Um, as I've uh, explained on a number of occasions here, uh, you know, when I came into the Mexico Institute uh, just over six years ago, I, uh, I decided that uh, rather than just having the events that uh, sort of occur depending upon uh, ev current events, we would try to create a, an annual calendar of events. Uh, and uh, we have four so far. We have our Security and Rule of Law Forum. We have a Border Forum in June. Uh, in the fall, we have an Energy Forum. And then in November, we tend to have a, an innovation forum. And we're thinking about creating an annual migration forum as well. Um, it's, it's worked extremely well, I would say, over the past uh, six years. As I say, this was the first one that we really launched um, back in uh, 2013. Um, we were launching new publications then, and we continue to launch new publications now. Um, the purpose of our annual event is really to get a... Uh, state of play on security and the rule of law in Mexico. So at least part of the, uh, the event is focused on where are we uh, in, in security in Mexico today. And it's very early on in the Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador administration. So whilst we don't want to jump to any uh, sort of lasting conclusions, it's important that we take uh, the temperature <clears throat> of security, rule of law, and public policy in those areas at this point in time. As always, we try to encourage uh, dialogue. We try to make sure that the analysis that we present is, uh, is based upon facts and impartial, neutral uh, analysis. We want to have open minds on, uh, on, on, on public policy. Um, but we also want to present uh, the opinions that are based upon analysis and research. And we hope to have uh, a lot of that today. Um, just so that everybody is aware, we did invite Mexican public officials, um, uh, people from Seguridad Pública, from Gobernación, from the embassy. Unfortunately, they were unable to make it, but we still want to have their opinion here. And so the invitations that we extended to them for this event, we will extend again so they can come and perhaps give uh, keynotes, uh, conferences uh, throughout the year. As I said, in the very first uh, uh, conference that we had back in 2013, um, we presented new research, and we're doing the same thing today. And uh, the first paper that I wanted to point out to you, which you hopefully you've grabbed a copy of outside, is uh, Merida 2.0 and the Future of Mexico-United States Security Cooperation, uh, a report prepared by Eric Olson, uh, my colleague here on my left. Um, this has already been launched at the Wilson Center, um, but we wanted to make sure that you're aware of it in the context of today's discussions. Um, and uh, that's a part of a conversation that we want to keep going, uh, not just here in Washington, but in Mexico City. Uh, then we have a, a terrific new paper um, that we've uh, produced in conjunction with Insight Crime. Uh, the investigative team uh, formed by Stephen Dudley, Deborah Bonello, Jaime Lopez Aranda, Mario Moreno, Tristan Clavel, Bjorn Kjellstad, and Juan Jose Restrepo. Um, this is a, a paper that uh, I talked to Steve Dudley about a, a, a quite a while ago, and I said it would be very, very good if we could try to understand Mexico's role in, uh, in fentanyl and uh, how it's impacting not just upon the United States, but how it impacts upon organized crime within Mexico. We then have another paper on, uh, on fentanyl, the U.S. fentanyl boom and the Mexican opium crisis, um, which is a, uh, a paper that has been prepared for us um, by, uh, by three authors, uh, Romain Lacour, um, and then uh, we have uh, Benjamin Smith, 
and uh, Nathaniel Morris. That is a, uh, a paper which we're delighted um, to be able to put out with the Wilson logo on. It's being produced by uh, three organizations, in fact, um, uh, including the Justice in Mexico project from the University of uh, San Diego. Um, our uh, global fellow, David Shirk, who will be with us later on today, um, helped with the preparation and the formatting and editing of that paper. And lastly, let me say we have uh, the testimony um, that was uh, presented by uh, Ambassador uh, Tony Wayne before the Senate Committee on the Judiciary Subcommittee on Border Security and Immigration um, recently. <clears throat> and uh, it's a very, very important role that the Mexico Institute ha has uh, in presenting ideas, opinions to um, congressional uh, uh, committees, and particularly at the hearings themselves. Um, it's, uh, it's actually part of our mandate as the Wilson Center to try to inform public policy, in particular, to work with Congress. So I'm very grateful to Ambassador Wayne for uh, performing that function and to be able to talk about those ideas today. Um, thanks to all of the panelists who have come in here today. Um, some of them have come from a very, very long way away, uh, flown across the Atlantic to escape uh, the dreary European weather to find dreary European <laughs> weather here in Washington. This is the, the reason why I left my dreary little island many years ago, but it follows me wherever I go, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm sorry, Diana. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But uh, we're very grateful for you to make the effort. Um, thanks also to all the staff who, uh, who worked so hard to make this event uh, happen. And lastly, and as, uh, as a way of segue, let me thank uh, Eric Olson, who has done such sterling service for the Wilson Center over many, many years. Um, he is no longer full-time staff here at the, uh, at the Wilson Center, but he is a uh, senior consultant and a global fellow with the Mexico Institute. He continues to work with the Latin American program. Um, his full-time job is now with the Seattle Foundation. Um, but Eric, thank you so much for, for organizing this event as you do every year. Thanks for everything that you do for us. And uh, thanks for generally being a good egg. And with that, I will turn the uh, microphone over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Duncan. I don't know if I've ever been called an egg before. Egg head, maybe, but, but I, I do appreciate that. And thank you, Duncan, for making this annual conversation a priority. We do a lot more than just this annual meeting uh, on this issue, but, but it's nice to have this time to st take stock and reflect on, on the situation in Mexico, and not only Mexico, but U.S.-Mexican relations in terms of security cooperations. And as the uh, title of this conference suggests, we're at a unique moment with a new government uh, in Mexico, but facing a lot of the same old problems, I'm afraid to say. Um, so it's a good time to take stock, to take a moment to look at what, what is ahead, what is being proposed, what are the dynamics between both countries. As so many of you know, uh, 2017 and 2018 set records for homicides in Mexico, and I can say I was very active at the Mexico Institute back in 2010, 2011, when I thought it can't get any worse than this, and here we are uh, eight, nine years later, and things don't seem to be all that much better. Acknowledging some improvements along the way, dips in 2014, 2015, but we're back at an incredibly difficult time in terms of security in Mexico. Uh, violence, homicide, and insecurity were top priority for Mexican voters when they went to uh, elect a new president just last July. Uh, and in that process, they elected uh, someone who promised, some, that someone being Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, someone who prom promised to deal with these problems in new and innovative ways to reduce violence, fight corruption, end the war on drugs, and restore peace throughout the land. These are, of course, excellent goals, things we all can support and be behind. But how we get there, and how Mexico in particular gets there, is not entirely clear. And it wasn't then, and we're only now just two months into this new administration, beginning to get a, view, a subtle uh, view of what direction the new president, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, hopes to uh, take in this issue. It may be too early to evaluate this process, this strategy, as Duncan said, but we can certainly begin to analyze and think about what its component parts are. And we tried to summarize those component parts 
in the paper that Duncan referred to called Medida 2.0 that's available online and in the back in printed form. I think it's also important to realize that the United States had a really bad year last year. 70,000 Americans uh, died of drug overdoses. Now, not all those drugs came from Mexico, let's be clear about it. Uh, a lot of them were produced in the United States. Uh, a lot of them came from China. Uh, it's not Mexico's fault, but clearly these dynamics don't necessarily respect international borders. And there is an element to the situation of drug uh, overdoses and crisis in the United States that it, it plays itself out in also in Mexico. And for that reason, of course, we thought it was really important, as Duncan said, to delve into this issue of fentanyl uh, and how it's uh, being produced and how what the routes are and what role Mexico, not as a government, but the Mexican uh, uh, terrain and organizations play in that uh, trafficking. Um, also, this is the 11th year of the Medida Initiative. The Medida Initiative, which was first hammered out by in negotiations between uh, Felipe Calderon, then president of Mexico, and, the, and, and former President George W. Bush. Um, and while that uh, Mexico, I mean, sorry, Merida initiative has evolved over time, each new U.S. president, each new Mexican president has given it uh, a slightly different prioritization, and it's evolved in its uh, focus. Uh, essentially, that framework of shared responsibility that was established uh, in 2007 and 2008 continue to be the framework for cooperation between the two. So 11 years of that experience, uh, some could easily say, well, we have nothing to show for it. I'm not sure that's entirely true. There are things that have happened that have been good and positive for Mexico and the United States, but there's no question that uh, uh, there are still major challenges in Mexico in terms of homicides, in terms of, uh, of justice reform, uh, of, of improved public security uh, capacity in the country. So we have an opportunity to begin thinking about what next in terms of U.S.-Mexico and security cooperation. Um, so we are delighted to have a panel to help us kick off some of these ideas, kick off some of these questions, uh, and help us uh, delve in a bit further. Um, now, um, we, uh, I want to introduce our panelists, but I do want to make one note. One of our illustrious panelists is currently somewhere between Newark, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. David Shirk, uh, in uh, his usual fashion, is trying to do uh, too many things at once. If we could clone David Shirk, we would do it, but that's not possible. So he apparently left after his class last night in Puebla or Mexico City, got stuck in Newark because of the weather, but he's making his way here. So we will proceed with our three panelists. At some point, David Shirk will appear, uh, and we will bring him into the conversation because he always has invaluable and useful things to, to, to share with us. So for now, we're going to start uh, with the uh, three panelists uh, that are with us. First, Edna Jaime. And uh, Edna Jaime has been with us here at the Mexico Institute on, excuse me, on many occasions. And she is now the general director and founder of Mexico Evalúa, one of the leading think tanks in Mexico uh, that's focused on evaluating and monitoring government uh, performance concerning public finances, accountability, transparency, security, justice, and combating corruption. If you don't know their work uh, monitoring the justice reform and justice process in Mexico, I highly recommend it. It's the go-to really source that analyzes very systematic what's happening in the justice yeah. system. So I'm, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to, to collaborate with Edna and Mexico Evalua. Uh, uh, Edna has a weekly column in El Financiero. Um, I'm sorry? Yes, that, that's correct. <laughs> uh, El Financiero, and I also, if you read Spanish, highly recommend uh, reading her column. Um, she hits on all the major 
uh, security issues and issues that the government's dealing with. So it's highly recommendo recommendable, and thank you, Edna, for being with us. Then we'll hear from Enrique Betancourt, also a, a longtime partner and collaborator mm -hmm. uh, with us here at the Mexico Institute. Uh, Enrique is the director of the Violence and Crime Prevention Initiative for Comonix International, based here in Washington, D.C., He's a trained architect and urban planner. Hmm, what does that have to do with crime prevention? A lot, it turns out. <laughs> a lot, it turns out. Uh, who, and he was once the executive director at the National Center for Crime Prevention and Citizen Participation in Mexico, which is where I first uh, got to know Enrique and admire his work. Uh, he's an expert on urban innovation, and he co-founded Contextual, an agency developing creative solutions to complex urban problems through collaborative and participatory design. We are delighted to have Enrique with us once again to talk on this issue of crime prevention, violence reduction, which of course, as I said, it was at the heart of what the President of Mexico promised to deal with. So we thank you, Enrique. And then last but not least, we are delighted to have with us Ambassador Earl Anthony Wayne, uh, Tony Wayne is the former U.S. ambassador to Mexico and that other minor country in South America, sometimes known as Argentina. No, I shouldn't have said that, right? Mexico, yeah, so he was, the, yeah, they meant on Argentina, but we're <laughs> ignoring them. Um, but no, uh, he had an illustrious uh, diplomatic career in Mexico as ambassador in Argentina. He was the deputy U.S. Ambassador in Afghanistan and Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs, as well as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. Um, he has, as I say, a long distinguished career. He is now uh, a public policy fellow here at the Wilson Center and co-chair of the Mexico Institute Board Advisory Board here at the Wilson Center. Um, he co-chairs uh, with a Mexican counterpart and we're delighted to have you with us. He's also been an advisor, uh, non-executive director on the Financial System Risk Advisory Committee of HSBC Latin America, and he serves uh, uh, as a non-resident fellow and scholar at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Atlantic Council. And I'll just point out one last thing. Uh, Tony is also treasurer of the American Foreign Service Association and treasurer of its PAC, and he's been a passionate defender, I think I can say that, of uh, the career foreign service officers. And so, yeah, there's a few of us out there. So thank you, Tony, for your service to our country and to our diplomats as well. So anyway, uh, thank you all. Um, we will uh, give you each 15 minutes. Perfect. And we'll start with Edna. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, uh, and thanks, Eric uh, Duncan, for this extraordinary opportunity to be among my dear friends and colleagues. I would like to share with you a brief overview of the challenges faced by Mexico in terms of public security. C can I have it? Uh, oh, sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First, some political context uh, will be useful to understand how Mexico, Mexico Evalua, Mexico Evalua and myself are seeing things. If you don't live in Mexico, let me tell you something very honestly. The last seven months in Mexico ha have felt like seven years. <laughs> countless, countless things have happened since election day in July. We have had one of the most tumultuous starts of any incoming administration. And there are three features of th for this period, of this period. First, Rush. In his inaugural speech, President López Obrador said that he will try to accomplish a historical transformation of Mexico in only six years. So the pace of important decisions legislative bills, statements, and speeches has just been relentless. Every time the policy community tries to participate in the conversation of a particular decision, a new one comes and becomes the center of a heated debate. 
the lasts until the next big announcement, announcement comes along. The second feature is stress. The new administration is carrying out a blitz to alter or to change the institutional arrangement built in the, in the last three decades in Mexico and replace it with something with far-reaching consequences that nobody can still fully grasp. This has put the Mexican political system on, under a lot of stress. The clash with the judiciary, with autonomous institutions, the, med the media and civil society organizations have been rough, creating concerns about the strength of his commitment to democratic norms. And the third is improvisation. In some realms, policy planning has been replaced by strong, strong quick action from the president. President's cabinet has shown a worrying degree of inexperience and lack of technical knowledge in key areas of policy making. So speed, stress, and improvisation are also present in the formulation of the new administration public security strategy. During his presidential campaign, AMLO was very clear. He said countless times that he wanted to radically break away from the security policy followed by his predecessors, Presidents Calderón and Peña Nieto. He promised a totally different approach, one based on what he called the pacification of Mexico. Pulling out the armed, armed force from public security was a common promise in his campaign speeches. Two months and few more days have passed since AMLO took office. And what we can see is that he changed his mind in a very radical way. And I wonder what he saw, what new elements did he have to take, to take such a radical change of direction in his policy approach towards secu security. From my perspective, his agenda has been defined mainly by three concepts. National Guard, Centralism, and Penal Populism. Let me start with National Guard. The National Guard was a shocking surprise for everyone, at least, at least for me. In his campaign, the, prom the president promised to pull out the military from public security policy. But as soon as he took office, he proposed a National Guard as a military body in charge of public security with national-wide presence and with jurisdiction at the federal and local levels, something totally unprecedented. The National Guard has been the most discussed and controversial, controversial aspect of AMLO's security strategy. Although the role of the military in public security has been a resource has been a resource of the last two administrations. You can see it in the slide how, how defense budget has been increasing a lot no? with no clear results, as you can also say, see in the slide, uh, and increased human rights violations. The current administration is trying to, co to communicate that the new body will be under civil authority trained under police protocols and it will be and it will respect human rights. The administration is trying to convince us that it is not all wine in new bottles. Nonetheless, its institutional design does not include include clear controls and an oversight strategy. The budgetary and the opera operational responsibilities will stay in the military's hands with clear negative effects or consequences for civil police forces. The current proposal still lacks of an institutional frame framework to prevent, or if the case, to detect and sanction 
human rights violations. If this project comes to life, the country will be keeping towards the militarization of public security operations without the proper framework for institutional oversight. And I think that an historical opportunity will be missed, a call to redesign, relaunch, and prioritize on police strengthening. This strategy might reinforce, instead of solve, some of the factors that have been fueling the current crisis. There is also a concern that few observers, observers have pointed out. AMLO is playing to be a sorcerer's ap apprentice, as he is changing the nature of civil military re relationships, <coughs> one of the pillars of Mexico's relative political stability during the last eight decades. Some will say that he is so clever that he has given the military a lot of power, so they support him un unconditionally. But others are concerned because the National Guard will be a new fourth branch of the Mexican armed forces, operating with his own doctrine and criteria. Some fear that the National Guard could very well be AMLO's own politicized and biased, an ideologically biased army. So I ask you, who will end having the upper hand? The president and his na national guard or the whole structure of the military? I think it is a high stakes bet and I am afraid that none of the answer is good for the future of liberal democracy in Mexico. Now, it is only a matter of time for an AMLO-dominated Congress to approve the constitutional reform needed to create the National Guard. The lower chamber already approved it, and as we speak, the diminished opposition in the Senate and a group of civil society organizations are managing to stop the fast-track approval in the upper chamber. They, we, are fighting a legislative battle to make the National Guard as accountable as possible. But there is a fundamental fact. Uh, most Mexicans approve the idea. The National Guard is as popular as López Obrador. It is very difficult to explain how the social vision of a cell Professor left wing president can coexist with the right wing policy of fully and permanently militarized public security. But the National Guard will be a fact of life in the years to come. I think that there's no doubt about it. The second the second problem with a new administration strategy is centralism. <coughs> Imagine this scenario. Imagine that the President of the United States thinks that, for instance, the state of Arizona cannot stop illegal immigration. So President Trump announces that he will send a personal representative holding a newly created position called Federal Delegate. Imagine that this delegate only answers to the president. That, that person will have under his or her control all the federal transfers to the state and all the federal resources, including, of course, the National Guard. What do you think Arizona will do? What will this mean to American federalism? What risk will this pose for the future of rule of law? Well, that is what is happening in Mexico. President López Obrador sees the lack of coordination between federal, state, and municipal authorities as one of the reasons behind Mexico's current security crisis. And he's right. 
a failed governance structure for security issues is behind the problem. But does AMLO sees the centralization of power as the answer. His strategy has included uh, the creation of 260 regions within the country. These regions will help to focus the institutional instruments on specific points according to how bad things are in terms of public security. Each region will conduct all the federal policy programs on the decentralized supervision of AMLO's very own superdelegates. So, a very dysfunctional and underdeveloped federal structure will coexist with a centralized discretional scheme. Mm -hmm. One can only foresee some important difficulties. The first one, jurisdiction disputes between the federation and the local governments will remain. Lack of incentives for governors and mayors to create or strengthen their own, own local security forces. And deepening of the state government's de dependency on the federal government's funds and programs. I think that this strategy will continue to stimulate a harmful subordination uh, instead of encouraging a functional joint responsibility. And the, th the th third future is penal populism. Last year, in September, Lopez Obrador Party, Morena, presented a bill that proposes to include more offenses on the list of crimes that qualify for our automatic preventive prison. The new offenses to be included were misuse of social programs for electoral purposes, fuel robbery, and corruption in the form of illegal enrichment or embezzlement. The president and his party I think, are now promoters of penal populism. They want to be perceived as tough on crime and particularly tough on corruption. To do that, they use the old argument that says that tougher sanctions equals less crime. But as you know, this is not the case. Penal populism is ineffective to stop crime it is actually a potential source of other problems like an, an overrun justice system, criminalization of poverty, more impunity, and human right, rights violations. Additionally, accusations of corruption and electoral crimes can be used by an all-powerful president as weapons to intimidate the opposition, particularly if the principle of presumption of innocence is forsaken. So what can we do? Mm -hmm. And we need to keep pushing to make the National Guard as accountable as possible. We need to keep pushing to consolidate well-trained, well-equipped, -equi professional, accountable, civil police forces. And we need to keep pushing to keep alive our agenda, this, this particular agenda that we in Mexico we will be uh, developing of focalized prevention policy, control of weapon proliferation, improve the prison system, the consolidation of the new accusatory penal system, improving attention to crime victims, focus in the institutional dimension of local context to design sustainable, sustainable policies. We need to keep pushing to introduce, introduce changes in the security paradigm and break with toxic inertias. <coughs> to do this, we need the support of the United States policy community now more than ever. Mm -hmm. 
Mexican civil society organizations need the support of institutions like the Woodrow Wilson Center to shed light on what is going on in Mexico and envision different ways <coughs> to improve security. We need all the support we can get from our friends here in the United States, think tanks and academia. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Edna. Thank you for uh, highlighting some of the maybe unexpected directions that this administration seems to be be taking, uh, uh, especially in terms of the emphasis on this new s National Guard and uh, concentration of power um, and an appeals to populism. Uh, there's no question, I mean, it, there seems to be no question that much of what the president has done has been very popular. And so you're, you're, you're you know, I think people are c dealing with this issue of what's popular, what is part of the public demand, and what is effective. And sometimes those issues get separated. So thank you for highlighting that. Enrique, thank you for being here. Um, you know, <coughs> the president said so much about social investments and uh, um, um, reducing violence. Um, so we're anxious to hear what you have to say, given your vast experience in this area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to be back here at the Wilson Center with uh, so many friends and colleagues here and in, in, in down there. Um, yes, I wish, I wish I could be, you know, Eric already introduced me as an architect and planner. I think one characteristic that we all architects and planners share is being optimistic. We're always foreseeing the future <laughs> and we always try to do it with, with optimism. And, and I wish I could be here with more optimism than the one that I, I also already sense um, um, pessimism that already Edna has uh, uh, put on the table. I, I cannot be optimistic, uh, but I can be hopeful on a couple of things. Um, so yes, I think uh, it's very clear <coughs> Uh, you know, during the campaign, during the transition, and even through these first uh, early days of the administration, uh, violence reduction has been part of the agenda. It's part of the narrative. Uh, it has been uh, aligned with what voters want and wanted in Mexico. Uh, I think it, that's completely aligned also with all uh, who are here today presenting and listening want. Uh, that's that's a very interesting um, uh, concept because you know let, let's remember uh, a goal was set by by the new minister of security uh, a 30 to 50 percent reduction in <coughs> homicides during the first three years of administration. Uh, it's, it's obviously, as we all know, a very challenging, a very difficult maybe to achieve uh, goal, but at least there's a number there. There's, there's, a, there's some commitment, apparently, in the narrative. Um, and there's, there's a reason to celebrate even, even that particular um, instance. Now, having said that, anyone following Mexico in the last at least 12 years can attest that reducing the homicide rate is not easy, uh, that this is a very stubborn and sticky problem, that this is a problem that is also very dynamic, the problem has moved from state to state, from city to city. Uh, you know, Juarez, the Juarez of today is not, I, I mean, Acapulco is today, of, the, uh, you know, it's, it's now the most violent city in, in the country. It was Juarez, Tijuana is going back, Colima State is, is probably in the worst uh, moment in history. So this is, this is a very stubborn problem. But also, besides being a, a very stubborn problem, it's also, we have to admit, this is also a symptom of other very deep uh, causes and malfunctions of, in Mexico. Um, and, and, and the usual suspects, I guess, I guess the, 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 the title of the, of the <coughs> panel is, is really good. You know, all, all challenges, right? The, 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 the usual suspects, right? Uh, weak insti justice institutions, very weak police enforcement, uh, organized crime, uh, the cifra negra, generalized impunity, generalized but also selective impunity, 
right? Impunity rates are not the same for all Mexicans, do not apply the same uh, across populations. Uh, so so this, this, these problems, as we know, these are not problems that are interesting for the right or the left. I think uh, the, the, the conversation about right or left in Mexico and many other parts of the world, I believe it's over. I, 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 that's why we see uh, a left-leaning uh, president or candidate suddenly making very right-wing decisions. I think uh, uh, populism is back. I think many, many of these uh, more also practical decisions might be on the table. And, and you know, this, this, is, this is when we start, you know, questioning this, this initial celebration about setting a goal to reduce and to include in the narrative, to, to include uh, as a central piece of the agenda this question of, of violence reduction. We've been there before, right? Six years ago, the, the, the Peña Nieto administration started uh, you know, putting, putting uh, violence reduction, violence prevention at the center of the agenda. We know how that went. We know how the National Program for Crime Prevention end, ended up uh, during the last years. We've seen the graphics in terms of homicide rate in Mexico. So, so we've been there. We've been there with the promises. We've been there with the agenda. We've been there with the narratives. The question now, I guess, becomes how? Okay, so this is the goal. Uh, explain me. This is, this is, I think, the most important question we need to com continue asking. When, when Edna says we, we need to keep pushing, uh, I think the first push I would propose is to ask for a theory of change. I would ask to, you know, the government to explain me why and how the National Guard is going to change things. I'm going to ask why uh, uh, penal populism is going to change things. I'm going to know why and how centralism is going to change things when all the evidence that we have shows the other way around. Um, when we, like maybe 10 days ago, 15 days ago, uh, the government released their national public security strategy. No, strategy. Um, as many have already, other analysts and friends have already uh, addressed in, in, in social media and in, in, in their analysis, this document, this document really lacks um, you know, the basic components to really be called a strategy. The, 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 the document, it's, it's, a, it's a, a Alejandro Ope, who has been here before, uh, described it as a cut and paste document, basically cutting and pasting from different documents into one that tries to sign out how these things will work. And when you read this document, um, you see that there's there's a very very complex uh, set of conflicts in terms of positions. You could say even with, within AMLO's team, you you see you see the penal populism, but you also see the effort to reg to, to regulate the guard. You also see space and good news in terms of uh, leaving intact the federal approach to just to to security. They, they respect uh, the presence of, uh, of municipal police forces. You read about social crime prevention, maybe very naive, I would say, very naive approaches to, to, to crime prevention as a whole, but you see that. So I, I think I, I, you could, if you see this document, you could really read this battle inside of the administration. I think, and, and maybe, maybe this is one of my first kind of observations. I, I absolutely agree with Edna's uh, pessimism, but I think um, I would assume, or I'm reading, I'm, 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 I'm wondering if this administration is as disciplined and, and as cohesive as uh, sometimes we, we were perceiving it. Uh, and this is, this is where the push needs to happen, right? Underst you know, read the cracks, understand who are the players within the team, uh, and, and establish uh, ways to inform and, and, and engage with 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 uh, with administration. Um, if you read the national public security strategy and you and you present it in front of the challenge, if you present it in front of the drug uh, 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 organized crime, 
if you present it in front of the homicide rate, if you present it in front of the weaknesses of you know, our institutions and the police forces, and if you present it in front of the National Guard and the, the penal populism and all things that or, or Edna already have addressed, I mean, you, you could basically say, okay, the, the battle is over. Uh, but I, th I think there are, there are good news. Um, you know, um, whoever would be running the country would be facing the same kind of circumstances, generally speaking, right? The, the, the institutions were weak, the, the, the police was weak, uh, impunity was high, homicide was high, right? Uh, even within this context, we've seen interesting examples, we've seen interesting results, and, re and very interesting efforts being made at the local level in Mexico. I think the, the particular case of Morelia very recently, it's, it's, a, it's really uh, a source of hope uh, to show that even without the proper conditions, there are things that can be done. I think other countries have shown that even without having the strongest institutions, uh, homicide reduction can be achieved. I think uh, as Mexicans, for example, we have a lot to learn from the recent efforts in Guatemala to reduce homicide. I think there's still many lessons to be learned in terms of the efforts in Colombia. I think there are many, many examples in the U.S. that can also inform the Mexican policy. Um, I think New York, I think Chicago, I think the efforts even of failing cities in the U.S., the efforts of Baltimore, the efforts of, of New Orleans can inform uh, not only with best practices but also with fails, failures and efforts in, in, in try and error approaches uh, are our most interesting, I would say, ecosystem of innovation in terms of policy, which is the local governments and the state governments in Mexico. Um, many governors will be key in this effort. I think uh, Chihuahua, I think Jalisco, and may, probably many others uh, will, will try to obviously uh, defend the, the federalism. I hope they can do it. I, I, I come, again, uh, this, is, this is, I wanna highlight the word hope. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, this good news can, can, can be transferred. I mean, what, what happened in Juarez, what happened in Tijuana years ago um, are also examples that we can uh, uh, you know, go to and, and, and try to learn. So, so you know, in my mind, in, in more think about this push that Edna uh, uh, spoke about, I think there are, for me, there are four main challenges down the road. The, third one, the first one is to really uh, push for uh, a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift based uh, on the notion that Mexico as a federal country with the size of the country that we have cannot be addressed with a top-down, centralized, one-size-fits-all kind of solution, right? There are, there are incredible amounts of tones of gray in the country uh, and the strategy needs to really to understand that the majority of violence is fueled by local dynamics, much more than we think. And I think that this is this is one of the w one of the things why w one of the reasons why I think Morelia is such a great example, because um, Morelia, Morelia Morelia was able to 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 come up with a strategy tailored to the very local conditions of Morelia, uh, to their budget, to their local capacity. And I think this is something that needs to be uh, strengthened and, and, and understood better. The second is, is the trajectory of the solution. Uh, aligning these conflicting narratives within the strategy, I think is gonna be very important. I think all of them have, I mean, every, every pu public security strategy needs to incorporate many of these approaches. Yes, you have to be punitive, but you also have to provide opportunity. You have to partner these two uh, mindsets in a public security strategy. The question is how do you articulate them? Who's responsible of that? If you don't have someone responsible for bridging this, the gap between these two lines of thought, uh, usually things don't work out. Things either, you know, we either go very naive in terms of, you know, pr promoting the idea of better jobs and education to, to end the problem that has been there for many years, uh, thinking that pre prevention is retroactive, and we know it's not the case, or we just go, you know, tough on crime, 
Uh, I think we we don't have the luxury of choosing between these two. I think we really need to bridge them uh, together. Having said this, uh, and maybe maybe as as a conclusion to this first uh, challenge, the paradigm shift, I would say that the, the most important need is to bridge justice and security efforts. This sounds very, um, I guess, straightforward. But in reality, if you see the efforts in, on the justice side of things, justice efforts uh, and, and resources, financial resources, programs, have focused very much on improving the operational aspects of the system. It's been a conversation between lawyers to make the system more fluent. It's, it's been a, a, a system-centric approach uh, to improvement, which is OK. But the counter-reform and the, the reason why the National Guard, for example, is so popular in Mexico is because the regular Mexican, the average Mexican, haven't seen the benefit of the new justice system on the ground yet, right? So we have spent all this time, we have heard all this concept all the time, but when I, you know, when something happens to me in the street and, and I approach police, when I end up going to the Ministerio Público, you know, it's business as usual. So the justice efforts really need to start focusing more, I would say, at street level uh, to really produce results. And security efforts need to focus more on particular targets. If security means car robbery, if security means uh, drug enforcement, if security means homicides, if security means domestic violence, all of that, I think we, 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 will, we have mission, we, you know, we end up having mission creep. Um, the second challenge I, I, I foresee is, is the challenge of strategic design. Going back to this idea of theory of change. There's, there hasn't been for years in Mexico, despite all these investments, a single document that describes what we want to achieve in concrete terms. And, and I'm sorry for, for peace builders, but peace is a very difficult concept to evaluate. Right, so, so we need numbers, we need metrics. Uh, so, so again, we haven't had a concrete objective and, and a clear description of how we want to achieve that. I understand there are national security concerns and stuff like that, but I think a general explanation to the public saying, this is how we intend to solve this problem, and this is how the National Guard plays in as, as one of the players of this very large and complex game, and this is how these penal measures are playing in, then we can have a discussion on whether this hypothesis will work or not. Unless we have that, I think that's the minimum uh, um, level of information that we all deserve, an explanation <coughs> of how the government intends to address this challenge, uh, which is a strategic design challenge, as, as, as I, I, I want to put it. Um, the, th the third uh, uh, challenge is, is the challenge to inform this theory of change with evidence. There's hard evidence already in our hands, uh, thanks to the work of many colleagues in, in many countries and many years of violence prevention work, uh, you know, that highlight the importance of targeting people specific people in specific places, uh, in specific networks, social networks, uh, displaying specific behaviors. I think, uh, I think this, this kind of, this level of granularity that we're talking about is not, is not by neighborhood. It's even, it's even you know, smaller than that. It's not by, you know, a young kid from Juarez, from a poor neighborhood who didn't finish uh, middle school, that's not enough. And the level of, so the level of granularity needed to really address these issues, it's impossible to be perceived at the federal level. If you're operating from Mexico City or one of the states, I don't know, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Culture in Tlaxcala, now it has been relocated. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to really grasp, you know, these tones of gray that n are needed uh, when you're operating at, at the ground level. There's no way we'll have success unless we incorporate the, 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 the street level view that mayors and community members and NGO, local NGOs have uh, on the ground. 
Um, um, I, I hope, uh, I think, yes, thank you, Eric. I'm about to close. Uh, you know, this, this, this informing the theory of change with, with, uh, with more evidence also goes back to the, the penal populism. There's so much research, there's so much uh, information regarding how swift and certain consequences to certain crimes really are the ones that help reduce uh, or change behaviors. Uh, that there's no need to really go back to penal uh, to pen to strengthening penal measures uh, because we know that that doesn't work. And, and that I think it's it's proven. We really need the help of you know policy experts and people who understand this better uh, in the conversation to really inform and try to change uh, that particular aspect. I think that's the most uh, for me the most critical aspect to be to be addressed in in the conversation with the new administration. Uh, and, the, and the last challenge is, 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 is a practical one. As the Morelia case uh, shows, uh, there's room to test these innovations on the ground before we aim for big reforms. Uh, there's no need to have big reforms first and then try to innovate on the ground or to, 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 to yield uh, changes on the ground. Uh, so, so small experiments, demonstration projects uh, that incorporate or test these theories of change is in discrete places with discrete populations uh, can really, well documented, can really help uh, push for an agenda that is, it goes beyond um, what we have right now in terms of uh, communication uh, tools. So, so ju just to close down, um, you know, I think I think uh, I have I have made my case in terms of I mean I'm very skeptical of achieving substantial violence reduction F, uh, results uh, during this administration. I hope I'm wrong, but I, I'm I don't think we will see a dramatic change in the homicide rate in the coming years in Mexico, not with the trajectory that we see today. I th I'm very hopeful uh, for local responses. I'm very hopeful for uh, new innovations. I'm very hopeful for the work of you know NGOs and local local actors to really uh, uh, engage and try and try to test these innovations on the ground. So so with that you know maybe maybe just say that the window of opportunity that AMLO has uh, this this popularity represents you know rep I mean is there but it, it will not be there forever. Um, uh, I remember how Miguel Mancera started the administration six years ago at, at, the, at Mexico City, you know, and how quickly he lost it, right? I don't think it's the same case, but I think, I think this window of opportunity for AMLO and his team really represent an opportunity to, pr to propose the craziest idea they could, you know, propose and, 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 and people will follow. So, so uh, I don't know if this particular observation is the one that makes me more hopeful or more worried, uh, because because you th this team can propose whatever they want right now. Um, so that if if we can you know uh, help uh, change the trajectory of some of these uh, uh, conversations, uh, there's a lot that we could gain uh, for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Enrique. Um, you, you said there were four challenges, and I wrote down eight. So, uh, <laughs> but, but let me highlight three of them that I thought were really significant. One is this idea, uh, this idea of a paradigm shift is, is needed, that, it, that the solutions are not all at the federal level that we have to address, or, or Mexico needs to address the local challenges. The idea of bridging the judge, uh, justice and security paradigms um, is a perennial issue, even in this country, obviously. More police more, or more social workers, and maybe it's both. Uh, but that certainly has to be an element of here, uh, of this. And then the issue of strategic design and where you focus uh, seems really, really important to me. My concern has been that policymakers, and, and in this case, the government kind of confuses economic well-being generally which we, of course, all want, with the specific kinds of programs of, of violence reduction and violence prevention that, as you suggested, need to be very targeted on, on specific individuals. And so the confusion there, I think, is, is, is worrisome. 
Uh, not fatal, but something that I think is right for you to focus on. All right. Fine. Last but not least, uh, we will hear from Ambassador Tony Wayne. I should preface this by saying you are not speaking from the U.S. government for the U.S. government. Um, this is on your, based on your vast experience dealing with the relationship between the two countries, however. Thank you, Tony. Oh, thank you. Good. Since I've been out over three and a half years of the U.S. government, I hope I'm not speaking for the U.S. government. <laughs> no, but there can be confusion. I could. Of course, I'd be happy to speak for the U.S. government if they'd accept my recommendations. Yeah. No, it's a great pleasure to be here and to follow uh, two excellent presentations. I'm going to talk a little bit about this problem from the angle of U.S.-Mexico coordination. So I don't come to it optimistically or pessimistically. I come to it from the fact that each country faces really serious problems, and it's in the interest of both countries to find a way to work together. This has never been easy in my experience. It's always been a challenge and taken a lot of work to find that common agenda to go forward, and I think that's, that's true today still. The agendas of the two governments have overlap, but they are not totally the same. Driving the agenda largely in Mexico is the violence and, and the pain and horror that this is causing and the organized crime behind it. But that's not totally the same as the flow of drugs from Mexico to the United States and the flow of money and arms coming back. There's overlap, but they're not exactly the same thing. So the priorities of the two governments won't be totally lined up. The challenge is find that overlap and then make that as profitable as possible. And each can help the other a little bit with the other part of their agenda that really isn't as high a priority because you have, if you develop a mutually supportive relationship um, to work on that. And so, for example, from the United States, the, the clear priority is going to be on the flow of drugs coming north. And those, that flow is increasing. There, there is more heroin coming to the United States from Mexico. There are more synthetic drugs, both meth and fentanyl. And that fentanyl looks like it's now coming not only transshipment from China, uh, right directly up to the United States, but also possibly there's evidence now that, and you'll hear about this later, that fentanyl is actually being put together from precursors in Mexico. Um, and one of the reasons that there's this focus in Mexico on doing this is that the profits from these synthetic drugs are tremendous. And the recent report, which you can all see if you want to take a look at Stratford's uh, dozen an annual report. They have a really nice chart that just shows how much profit you get from synthetic drugs versus the other drugs. Now, there's still cocaine coming through, um, but that's not as profitable as these synthetics. So profit margins are driving a lot of this, and not surprisingly, that's the big priority for the United States. It's not quite such a high priority for Mexico, but it should be because it fuels a lot of, uh, maybe not as high, it should be a priority because it fuels a lot of the violence and the crime. It fuels a lot of the corruption. And over the past decade plus, all of that drug trafficking and all of the billions of dollars it has produced certainly have fueled the deterioration of the law and order and the justice system in Mexico. And that is in the interest of the current government that they tackle. The other thing to remember is that there is an overlap between fighting crime and the immigration issue. Certainly from a U.S. perspective, there's an overlap, but there's a very concrete overlap at the border. Most hard drugs enter the United States through the legal border crossing. And to the degree that they're able to get through easily there, that's a big problem. So one of the issues being debated, as you, right now, as you know right now in Washington, is uh, how much money should be put into new technology for that border. And the technology is available to dramatically increase scanning in both directions so you could detect a lot more of those drugs coming north and a lot more of any money, cash, 
money going south or arms going south if you had that scanning technology at these legal border crossings. And just a footnote, the Justice Department, DEA, has estimated 20 to $30 billion a year in profit from drug sales in the United States. That's a lot of money. You can buy a lot of guns. You can buy a lot of officials. You can also buy a lot of other things that we heard about in uh, El Chapo's trial. But it's a big problem in both directions. Secondly, and related to what my colleague said, um, you need to identify a common agenda, and then you need to agree a strategy of action. And that, in part, that has to be done, part of it bilaterally, but it really helps if Mexico actually has an agreed strategy that they implement well. And I'll be happy to talk about this in more depth, but in my experience, uh, none of the recent administrations in Mexico has had a coherent strategy that was well implemented. And so it's not surprising that there's a challenge right now, as my colleagues have pointed out, to do this. There were good elements in previous strategies, um, and there were less good, and there was poor implementation even of the good elements. Um, you know, the whole idea, for example, of reforming the justice system is a wonderful idea, and it was supported by many human rights activists and others for many years. Implementing it has been a mess and hard and difficult, um, in part because it would be a mess anywhere, but, <laughs> but it's not working, and it, exactly as Enrique said, a lot of people in Mexico now look to other options so favorably because they see no solution in the reform that's gone forward, let alone in the institutions that they've experienced their whole lives growing up. One of my good colleagues said, well, no, once upon a time when I arrived in Mexico, so this was in 2011, he said, okay, Tony, you'll know that the Merida Initiative is having success when a 12-year-old girl lost in a crowd actually runs up to a Mexican policeman and says, can you help me, rather than staying away from that policeman, as she would now do, because her parents have taught her you can't really trust that that's a good policeman. I mean, it might be, but it might not be. So that was sort of his way of teaching me that there needs to be this broader evolution, and when that starts happening, we'll see that we're all being successful, Mexico and the United States, in this broader issue. Um, in a number of the specifics that have been put forward, um, the idea of a National Guard, aside from if you take away that it's under the military, it is quite similar to what at the end of the Calderon administration was suggested that be a, an independent uh, gendarmerie. So the idea of a mechanism like that, you know, it, it could help, but you need to invest in it very wisely. They need to be well trained. You need to know what the doctrine is, as was mentioned. You need to, that's going to cost a lot of money to do that and a lot of attention to get it right. And then you have to look at how is this unit going to interact with the whole justice system. And as been mentioned, that really is not well developed in the current ideas being put forward. Consistently, the greatest weakness in the Mexican system in the years that I was there was the functioning of the justice system. A number of times, the two governments would work together, they would get the intelligence, the information, they would arrest the right people, and then these people would not be brought to trial and convicted. And this is true for drug crimes, it's also true for corruption. And this is just a major problem if you have this impunity built into the system, as both of my colleagues have said many times before, it's really hard to be effective. And from a bilateral perspective, it is really frustrating to have found the bad guys, have the bad guys rounded up, and then nothing happens to the bad guys. And then a lot of times, bilaterally, what this would end up is an, a, a a struggle over extradition. Okay, if you guys can't, aren't going to bring them to trial, send them to the United States. And then you get into those battles, and sometimes they did get sent to the United States and were brought to trial. But a lot of times, there was a lot of resistance to doing that. And we can talk about that in more depth if, if you want. So one of the keys here is, however the people of Mexico decide they're going to go forward, let's then work 
together, hopefully, on implementing that path well so it actually functions well for Mexico and for bilateral cooperation. One of the key themes that consistently has come up in my experience over this is uh, going after the money. Um, when, you know, if you think about it, the only change in this relationship has not been on the Mexican side. We had a new administration that came in here, and a lot of people struggled to find, let's keep this cooperation going with Mexico because they knew all the rhetoric about the border was going on, but it was still very important in the eyes of the law enforcement and justice community to keep that cooperation going with Mexico. So they came up in 2017, uh, so maybe something none of you noticed, with a joint strategy for fighting organized crime. And the idea was to go after the whole chain in the business of organized crime. And it actually was not a bad idea. It's not going to solve all crime. But it was a good idea to identify all those different places and aim at it. So one of the big things was, was getting the money. If you can break up the money, if you can m make it impo really hard to get your profits back, hard to finance what you're doing, that's a big step forward. But we have not, from either side, made great progress in doing, in doing that. Interestingly, one of the steps that the new administration in, in Mexico has talked about, in fact, is this same step of trying to go after the money. And they've been focusing on that and going after the oil thefts recently. This is just one example of a place where bilateral cooperation could be very fruitful because a lot of that money, even money if it's stolen in Mexico, or maybe a lot of money stolen in Mexico, ends up somehow touching the United States. An area that was only going to work, however, if you deal with another one of the big problems, that you actually can trust each other and that you actually have confidence in each other. And one of the things bilaterally that you need to do to, to tackle that is really have reduced units that are vetted. They're joint task forces. They're working on certain areas and the people in those task forces actually can trust that they can share information with each other and then take it to action afterwards, the arrest and then hopefully the, uh, the trial and conviction of this. All of which, as, as my colleagues have said, and, and I want to commend Eric's paper, it's a super paper for outlining all these issues, so please get it, it's out there, read it very carefully. Only if you have this really intense, detailed focus on getting all of these steps right are we going to be able to make progress in the common areas, but in the broader areas too, of public security cooperation between uh, these two neighbors, which is, is so important. The Merida Initiative, is, as Eric mentioned, I think to start off with, has been the umbrella that has covered a lot of this bilateral cooperation since 2008. Underneath this umbrella, there's been a lot of flexibility and changes in the way the United States and Mexico work together, both operationally and in the assistance programs. And those have evolved and developed over that time. For example, when we started this, we did some of these programs that Enrique was talking about in Ciudad Juarez and Monterrey aimed at local communities. And the whole idea there was not that the United States would do all of this for these local communities, but would show that with money and attention, these local communities could, in fact, address some of the problems of violence they were facing. The government of Mexico was then supposed to take those pilots and apply them other places by themselves and do that stuff. That just, that never really happened. But it doesn't mean this idea of this localized attention is not part of the solution. I think, in fact, it is part of the solution. But in any case, this, this joint, uh, jointness that we, we had under Merida, I think, still can bring a lot of benefit on both sides of the border as we take this forward. Um, the key is really, however, at this point, I think, sitting down and working through and getting a shared vision of where we can cooperate. Uh, this is no doubt happening on specific issues right now uh, between Mexico and the United States, um, in part because, as Ed m mentioned, there's a great emphasis on speed. Uh, I don't think it's, it's yet 
turned into the place where you actually sit down and strategically think through and define all of this. But it should, in my view, that should be a, a real aim for both governments to do that over the next several months as we take this forward. Let me just stop there, and then we can take some sure. questions and answers from Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. So we have a little over a half hour for questions. I'm going to start with a couple of my own to the panel, and then also obviously welcome if you want to respond to anything anybody else has said. But be prepared for your questions. Um, we have mics for people, so I'll turn to you in just a second. I, I thought I would just hit on a couple of things that were not mentioned, just to get some of your, your perspectives on it. One of them is... Um, Corruption, and, and a couple of people mentioned it, but I guess my question is, where should corruption be on the priority list? We often don't always think of corruption as part of a security strategy, or I should better place, said anti-corruption as part of a security strategy, but, but it's been mentioned, and it's, you know, let's, let's be frank, it's an issue. Um, where should that be on the priority list, and what do you think the the AMLO administration is doing in that regard. That was one question. The second one was, of course, the announcement recently that the war on drugs is over. Uh, what does that mean, frankly? Um, I, I wonder about that. And ending the war on drugs often, not saying in this case, but, but the AMLO administration did discuss at some point, have to do with the idea of regulating illicit uh, a, a market for illicit uh, uh, drugs, whether it's a regulated market for, for cannabis or regulated markets elsewhere. I know that uh, I think Alejandro Mandrasso and others have worked on this issue for a long time. Where do you think the administration, the AMLO administration, is on this issue of ending the war on drugs, what does that mean, and the idea of somehow creating regulated markets? Is that mostly you know, PR, or is there something real there? And I guess for Tony, just uh, uh, a couple quick questions. I know we've discussed in the past the need to elevate the dialogue between both countries to a higher level. Uh, I don't know if you still think that's a, a good idea, if that's happening already in an irregular way. There is the high-level dialogue on, econ on economic policy, I believe. Uh, where, where does that stand? Where should it go? And if you were to uh, begin a Merida 2.0, we've called it, but there may be some other cleverer name. I mean, are there one or two issues that you would add to the agenda uh, or highlight and further? You mentioned uh, combating uh, uh, illicit financing. Maybe that's it. But just if there's anything else you'd like to add on that front. So I'll start here with Edna and work our way down. And feel free to respond. Thank you, Rick. Uh, corruption is in the center of the president agenda, right? And it's also in the center of of, the, of Mexican expectations about this this government. And and you know, in the security plan that was just released one or week, uh, two weeks uh, ago, yeah. ago, it it is, is th this this is plan starts talking about corruption. But you know, I am not clear what is the president tools or strategy to fight corruption. It is mentioned, but there is no way it is um, at the result, it, it is uh, grounded. Gra grounded. And, and it has to do a lot of uh, his uh, particular way of, of handling power. And is centralizing. If there are a lot of risk of corruption, then uh, centralize decisions in a very inner circle mm -hmm. of, of, of president uh, um, right. staff or group. Uh, but, but I'm not seeing that in his agenda there is a clear path for institutional strengthening. Mm -hmm. Not at all. In fact, I am a part of, of the uh, recently uh, created a national anti-corruption system. Yeah. And he hasn't mentioned it at all. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. You know, I think he has a different um, approach to the problem 
very different of, of, of the consensus that was being created in Mexico, that we needed to strengthen state capabilities to prevent, to detect, and to sanction corruption. And, and but, but he's thinking s in something else. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what, why he's creating s these super delegates because they are going to overview, or over, uh, oversight, have a federal resources mm -hmm. that goes to the states. He's centralizing uh, a lot of decisions, but he doesn't have a clear uh, uh, plan to strengthen institutional capabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Because we can go very far mm -hmm. if we really don't um, strengthen uh, fiscalization, uh, auditing, uh, uh, criminal uh, criminal investigation around corruption, and he's he's not thinking about professionalization of, of these institutions, police institutions, and the way to eradic eradicate corruption from at least security institutions is professionalizing them, mm -hmm. generating uh, inner and external controls. Mm -hmm. But he's not in that page. Mm -hmm. He's thinking something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, very quickly, just to follow up on, on what Edna just mentioned. Um, first of all, I think I think there's some agreement or there's some a se there's a sense that uh, the, the, the narrative and the messaging still feels very much like a campaign. Right, so there's not much depth in terms of, you know, again, how things will happen, how much, when, how. Uh, uh, on the contrary, we've seen, you know, many actions being taken against the narrative. Um, uh, you know, we have seen already corruption included in the in the in the this list of preventive uh, prison, uh, which also shows a little bit of, you know, a taint. In, in, uh, of populism in these efforts against corruption. Where I think corruption could be targeted to achieve better security results, I think, I personally believe that it should be at the Ministerio Publico level. The I public ministry, the, public the ministry. prosecutors. Office. Yes, uh, which is a very, very, uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I've, I've been learning through time how, how important and how key this, this uh, uh, moment in, in, in the system is and and you know just just working out understanding better the 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 the, the potential incentives and the consequences of you know uh, um, uh, having a corrupt uh, public ministry in, uh, could be a very interesting way to really trigger better and and and, and some improvements in impunity, generally okay. speaking, um, against the war on drugs. I think you know. Um, there's obviously a very advanced discussion uh, on regards to cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that conversation, unfortunately, in terms of security, arrives too late. I think obviously uh, the, the, the shift of, and, and the, the accent uh, and, and the interest of uh, uh, organized crime has uh, shifted, has changed dramatically. You mean away from cannabis? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to be sure. Yeah. The effect. The effect of regulating the cannabis market will have a very, very uh, slim, I would say, effect on on the violence in Mexico. Um, we'll see how that goes. I think uh, obviously that's that's been uh, that you know as you said, Madrazo and many others have already pushed for that. Um, I don't. I don't see the capacity on the, or the intention to go to other types of drugs. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Ambassador. Well, first I would just say that, that corruption, fighting against corruption, I think it's just vital for restoring legitimacy to the system. And if you just think about the connection of the war of drugs, if you've got billions of dollars flowing in from that and you don't go after the corruption that that spurs, what's going to happen to your system? You can't, uh, you can't neglect corruption and you can't really neglect the war on drugs. What you can do is move away from a focus on high-value targets, which is what the government is trying to do, which I assume means that you won't, you will still capture high value targets if you can, yeah. but you're going to look at that whole chain of the different layers in a, in a cartel. And this, of course, the money flows, as the government has shown in its first actions on fuel theft, isn't just from drugs. Mm -hmm. There's a, there are billions of dollars worth of fuel that have been sold and whole networks of, uh, 
people have been supported by that illicit commerce. And that affects local officials as well, who have, uh, I think, profited from that, their finding. Right. So this is, it really is about getting at some of the other social values that AMLO says he wants to encourage. The pacification of the country is restoring the ethical base of the country, which he says he wants to do. So you have to act about this. Uh, it's not just, as Edna was saying, it's not just about personal uh, individual examples. You have to have institutions and you have to have examples of people brought to justice for stealing and uh, for other, as well as other kind of crimes. And I think that that's just a key part of what goes forward. Now, it is very fair to admit that any government coming to power on January, on December 1st uh, uh, in Mexico would have had a massive challenge to take on everything related to public security. The last government just completely fell down on the job, especially in its last years. Absolutely. And that's why you see on that chart that Edna put up that rise of homicides. It was just out of control and they didn't, they were either overwhelmed or just not focusing on it or, or whatever, but it was just a terrible uh, a record. And so anybody coming in would have a big job. And these guys are trying to not just handle that. As I just said, they're trying to bring about a revolution and transformation in many different institutions. So there's a lot to do. They are releasing a lot of the senior staff from the public service, which has meant a lot of very experienced people have left. Um, they reduced everybody's salaries tremendously, which was understand that was popular on some fronts. On the other hand, a lot of people just said, I can't raise my family in doing this. I'm leaving the government. So they're taking on this great transformation with a, a drain on the skills that they have in the government to do that at the same time. So it is a big task. Um, so we have to acknowledge and understand that. Um, but it is still a really important task. Finally, on the high-level dialogue, yes, high-level dialogues are really important um, to focus this, uh, this set of issues. The first uh, time, well, let me just give a little history. It was very hard to bring all of the agencies dealing with public security in the United States and in Mexico together. Um, and we established a high-level security group in 2013 for the first time. This was the first time that all the agencies from both sides of the government actually came together and sat down at the same table. And that group met once or twice a year in subsequent years. Um, that was really a really important step. One, for people were talking to each other, but two, it forced all the players to bring the important issues forward that were important to them and to actually address them. And that's why having these high-level uh, high level dialogues are really important. It presses all the agencies and everybody to think through, okay, what's important? What do I have to do, show that I've done and what do I want to get done? So yes, having an institution like that between these two neighbors where there are such serious challenges would be very valuable. Good. Thank you. Edna, you looked like you were going to jump out of your seat. Was there one thing you wanted to uh, mm -hmm. add? I, I, I just <laughs> wanted that to say that I find a mismatch be between what he's telling at the, the end of the war of drugs right. and the creation of a national guard that is, is reactive and is planned to continue the war. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I find this mismatch uh, and and I, th I what I find and, and I agree with with Enrique, that in the plan, you can find a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what is, I think, the most important feature of this plan is the National Guard. And, and, and I feel really sorry because we, we, we were creating a new consensus that could serve as the, the basis of a new paradigm that it was trying to, to uh, think security themes very locally. How do you strengthen local actors, state and uh, not state al actors, to create uh, uh, secure communities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And I think we are we are moving very rapidly away from this, away from, that. from that. Mm -hmm. I think there was an old saying in Mexico that I used to hear in Cuernavaca when I lived there, hay de verde, hay de rojo y hay de dulce. Sí, es, hay de There's rojo. red tamales, green tamales, and sweet tamales. You, you know, you take your pick. It's all there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think um, what that means is uh, we identify all the problems, but we don't prioritize, we don't strategize, mm -hmm. and so on. So anyway, thank you for your patience, everybody. We will take some audience questions at this time. We have a couple over here, a couple here, a couple in the back. Why don't you wait? Yeah, we'll start here. These two. Hi, I'm Pat Host from Jane's. I have a question for Edna. Has uh, President Obrador proposed a budget for his National Guard? Budget. Right. Yes. And uh, Dr. How Porter. much? Oh, let's take a couple okay. questions. Uh, uh, Dr. This, this question is for, for everybody, and it has to do with this critique of the National Guard. I do have a lot of questions. I mean, a lot of questions about that, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see this as a continuation of the war, as per se. A war is just an attempt to formalize the role of the federal forces um, in regions that where they are needed. I have talked to people from Chilapa and organizers um, of victims of disappeared families, and they tell you that they cannot live without. The, the, the army. So it is an attempt to institutionalize the utilization of, of, of the military force um, in a way that it's needed in the country. We have groups that are highly armed, criminal paramilitary groups, but I would like to, to, to know a little bit more why the critique and why this effort of the civil society and NGOs that were very critical or has been, have been very critical of, of the National Guard because this is not really an attempt to continue the war in my, in my understanding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We had a couple questions here and then we'll give people an opportunity. Thank you, Duncan Could you Wood. you identify yourself? Uh -huh. Yes, Duncan Wood from the uh, Mexico Institute. Um, <clears throat> first of all, congratulations. It was a terrific panel. I like the fact that we had diversity of opinion. It's very, very important that we do that here at the Wilson Center. I wish that we had a Mexican government official here who could explain their version of the story. So I once again issue the appeal to the Mexican government to send somebody to talk. Um, two very quick questions. Is there an appetite in Mexico for a Merida 2.0, for a new version of the Merida initiative? And secondly, particularly directed at Enrique, but anybody can join in here, your suggestions for that out-of-the-box thinking that you suggested, uh, that you said at the, uh, in your presentation. You know, now's the time to put forward novel ideas, innovative, and beyond just looking at sort of the local and state level, what would be one idea or two ideas that you could put forward? Was there, Diana, no other? Okay, we'll go with those three. Uh, there's some more questions in the back corner, but let's get some answers here. Edna, why don't you start? Uh, about budget, I don't have the exact amount, but you know, it, it uh, uh, Army was one of the winners of of 2019 budget R R reallocation or I'm sorry reallocation yeah reallocation reallocation big bin winner and you know th this is a, a, a zero sum play what the army get didn't didn't w l was l lost by civil institutions in security and justice system but he's a clear winner and he, he and they have been a clear winner from long year ago mm -hmm. and about your question you know what uh, the initiative um, established is to have military permanently doing security uh, issues permanently there are not there there is not an exit plan mm -hmm. you are putting the constitutions that army can do security public security uh, work and i agree uh, we don't we don't have the civil uh, institutions to bring security uh, to the country but but you know we are in a trap. We, we won't have them because the budget, the tension is going to the, mil to the military forces and, <coughs> no, and not to strengthen civil institutions. So what is really worrying 
is that is permanent. There is not an there is not an exit plan, and military are not trained for security issues, and 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 you know. Uh, statistics shows that when military uh, are involved in security issues, human rights violations rises, and is well documented. And I think it's one of the uh, uh, most um, the worries of of making them part of the national s scene in a permanent way. Mm -hmm. And and you know it's a trap if you st if you invest in army you are not doing the same with civil institutions. No. Mm -hmm. There's some and in, and the asymmetry just grows. Mm -hmm. Enrique? Yes, thank you. Um, regarding the guard, I think uh, just just to you know follow up on Edna, I think this is this the, the question here for me is a matter of time frames. We all agree. There are moments, there are places where we need the military on the streets uh, or in the territory, I would say. Uh, but the question is, how do we imagine the future? Like, do we want to have been that condition look, for 10, 20, 30 years? And then the question begins to, for me to be, you know, when do we start investing in the, the other option? And why does this government with these levels of popularity are not, is not addressing this to say, okay, we, ha we will do this and we will, this is time frame and these are the conditions in which we need this. Everybody would agree with that. But at the same time, we will start really focusing, really committing to strengthening, you know, civil police forces because that's how we imagine the future, right? That's the transformation I would think that we, we have to kind of envision, uh, but that's not there. So, so the fact that it's only focusing in a short-term condition for a very long-term or perm permanent solution, I think that's the one that is worried, uh, that besides other things. Uh, just, just going to, to um, Duncan's questions, I think the Merida 2.0, the appetite for that, I think there's appetite for that. I think um, the problem has changed. Uh, the, the problem that Calderon addressed, the problem that Peña Nieto addressed has changed. Uh, there are no more, you know, three or four cartels we have now, a much more granular kind of dynamic at, at, at the local level. I think uh, uh, there's many lessons that we have learned together in this process implementing Merida that need now to be uh, retrofitted into a new design. Uh, I think has been expressed already by the Mexican government. I, I, I think the new ambassador mentioned already the interest uh, uh, how advanced those could be, I don't know, but I think there's appetite for that. In terms of uh, innovations, uh, thinking out of the box, um, I, it's actually, I don't think there's a lot we can say in terms of innovations uh, at the national level. I think, I think it's going to the basics. I think if, I cannot imagine we will solve uh, or reduce homicide rates unless we have a clear strategy to do so, and I haven't seen one yet. So I would encourage the new government to uh, walk the talk and, and come up with a, with a violence reduction strategy, uh, which is fundamental. I mean, it's a very basic uh, notion. The innovations that I was referring to, uh, I will leave them to the local level. I think the implementation of, of that overall strategy the role of the government, of the of federal government, needs to be more, you know, providing financial resources, providing training, providing uh, methodologies, you know, strengthening the capacity of local uh, governments to implement this national strategy, and then let them understand their own context, uh, uh, modify that strategy in order to achieve results locally, and th that's where I think the innovation could happen. Uh, not not at the federal level. So so just defining an, an agenda where all the players have a role. The federal government has a role. The state government has a role. Uh, civil society, local governments, uh, in, in and the innovation will happen down there. And just to add two points. One, it it's very. I think it's very important to remember that there's a, essentially a funding cap mm -hmm. on how much money can be invested in public security because the government has committed to keep its overall budget within the same 
uh, bounds of the previous budget. And so it is trying to pay for all these changes and reforms within that budget. And that means they've been taking money away from some places That's like uh, children's uh, uh, care places that people are not happy with. And that's just because they're trying to be fiscally responsible. If you looked at what you could potentially invest in the National Guard and in the professionalization and in the other aspects of this public security, it would be very, very large. Um, so I think just remember that as important as we're looking at this. Secondly, it, it does go to Emerita 2.0. Um, the United States can be very helpful in training in, with some equipment, with some technology, um, and that can be very valuable to Mexico. And I think the new administration in Mexico is already starting to learn and will continue to learn why it can be mutually beneficial to have a continuation of this kind of collaborative program. I think it's imp to look back six years, it's important to rem remember we had almost a year of a central freeze in cooperation between uh, Mexico and the United States during the beginning of the Peña Nieto administration. Um, and that is not happening right now. There actually is cooperation and coordination going on. What hasn't happened is sitting down and thinking through this common agenda, in part, I think, because as Enrique has noted, the, the Mexicans are still working that through themselves. And they've come out with this initial policy. Uh, hopefully, as he suggested, they'll think it through now in more detail. And as part of that, we should be ready to sit down and define together what that common part of that agenda could be. Let me just throw in here on the innovation front, Duncan, just just uh, another idea, um, one that maybe won't solve all the problems, but I thought was very interesting. You know, Mexico every other year does this national victimization survey. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of questions about it, but basically it shows that that only about <coughs> 6 7% of crimes are actually reported, right? So there's like a 94% under-reporting of crime. When people ask why, the responses are varied, but it's a waste of time. We don't trust. We're afraid. You know, there's a lot of reasons people aren't reporting the crime. Now, when we met in October in our little working group around security, Bernardo uh, huh? León from Morelia had a very innovative approach. Rather than sitting in downtown offices saying, come in and report your crime, they were going out on the streets and literally asking people, what's going on in your neighborhood? We can take your denuncia, your, your complaint, here. We don't, you don't have to go downtown and wait in the office for long, lose a day of work, but be proactive. And that's the kind of thing that can happen at the local level that is not easy for the federal government to implement. Absolutely. So I think it's not that there's some hidden new program we hadn't thought about. It's how you conceptualize and how you implement these programs. That's the innovation, I think. Rethinking how government interacts with its citizens. And I think that would be a fundamental change in the case of Mexico. It's something that we need to do in the United States as well. Let's be honest about it. But anyway. Eric, and, and, uh, but we have to see how is going to be the, the in interaction yes. between this very centralized structure, sure, the National course. Guard, yes. with these local initiatives. Mm -hmm. yes. If the National Guard is overwhelming, is mm -hmm. a really is centralized and, and aims to control everything, we are going to see these initiatives just disappear. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, another round of questions. There are a bunch of them over here in this corner, so please identify yourself. And Good morning. My name is Jason Terry. Um, I work at Global Ties U.S., and we implement the um, U.S.-Mexico Police Pl Professionalization Exchange Program as part of Merida. Um, we've seen firsthand with the 2,500 people we've served in the last two years from mid and senior leadership in law enforcement that the militarization of security has been incredibly demoralizing for civil, for civilian police forces. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a question that we are having is that uh, the perception that we're seeing across policing in Mexico is that community policing in particular is an intelligence gathering mm -hmm. exercise. 
and we're having some struggles getting them to switch into more of a community security cooperation paradigm, which is what we're really trying to get at. So I was wondering if you had any sort of guidance on how to help shift that conversation. I think there were a couple more questions. Mary Speck had a question. And maybe that gentleman in the very back row there after Mary. Uh, Mary Speck, I'm a, a senior associate with CSIS at the moment. Um, I had a question specifically about the local, uh, local solutions and the political interest and in space there is for local solutions in, in Mexico. Um, I think both Edna and Enrique correctly point out that violence is now so dynamic and diversified and, and with a very local nature in Mexico that there need to be local solutions. And there are some interesting examples, such as Morelia. But either I, I, there don't seem to be very many local examples uh, of innovation. There doesn't seem to be much interest or on the part of local governments. Perhaps there's no funding or space on the part of local governments to, to innovate in this way, or perhaps it's just my ignorance. But um, I'd, li I'd like to know how much local governments, whether local governments, have the capacity and the political interest, especially with a president as popular and decentralizing as AMLO is, um, in really undertaking these kinds of innovations that you need to address the incredibly um, diverse and changing criminal landscape in Mexico. Excellent. One last question, a gentleman in the back. Thank there you. In uh, last row. Her Herbert uh, Francisco Curriar, so um, here's a private Mexican citizen. I have a question regarding the innovation and some of these uh, related issues of public finance. And has there been any thought in using performance-based finance and how that's allocated to states, whereby local authorities could develop these results, theory of change, and prove at a demonstration level what can and, and does work and where there are opportunities to improve some of these efforts at the state and local levels? Thank you. Could you hand the mic just right in front of you to the gentleman? I'm sorry. We'll take that as the last question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Jaime Lopez Aranda, today with Inside Crime. Uh, something that Edna and Enrique said really stuck with me, and they said in a completely different sense, if you will. Edna said, we need the help from people from the United States, I mean, people from here, United States, I mean, abroad, to push forward a less, um, to a counter agenda, if you will, in Mexico. At the same time, Enrique mentioned that he was cautiously hopeful, not optimistic, but hopeful, about the few signs that the new government has given and as to the direction of security. My question is, and this is not the kind of question that we can answer here or that you guys can answer just right here, <laughs> but it is a real question. What are we gonna do? I mean, we have to come up with an alternative and we haven't been able to promote a real alternative for the past 10 years. And I'm f talking about here think tanks, academia, NGOs. We, can, we have been kind of been following the lead of the government in this discussion. I mean, not this government, but the previous ones as well. And this is the first time that the government moves the goalposts so f much <laughs> that we end up not following their lead, but trailing them. <laughs> I mean, they're going in a completely different direction now. Yeah. So the question is, and again, this might be something to reflect today or, I mean, to work on the, towards the future, is like, how do we come up with a real counter-agenda here? <laughs> because saying that the Guardia Nacional is, is experimenting militarization, I mean, it's a statement of fact. <laughs> it's not a counter-proposal. As and, and I mentioned, I mean, corruption does not really play a role in the government's agenda. And the national and the national anti-corruption system is not being able to bring it forth at this point. Right. Can we? Let, I need to. Sorry, cut you off there. But let's have the panelists respond, and then uh, we'll take a break. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the, the, the first question that I think that is really demoralizing for for civil police, what is going on? Mainly the federal police. You know, uh, I think that it, it, it the, the federal police has been the most advanced effort to create and, and to strengthen a, a civil uh, security institution. And now it is going to be dis dismantled. Incredible. And, and in, in his in inaugural address, the president said they were corrupt. Hmm. With no, making no difference between them and giving no 
evidence at all. So, it, and I think it's, it, 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 as as uh, our colleague said, they are very important in, in intelligence gathering. The last time I was invited here in, uh, by, uh, to the to the Wilson Center, I presented a, a work uh, that we were doing with uh, with Mexico City Police identifying hotspots and doing a very hyper local diagnosis. And, and we were really enthusiastic uh, 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 around the potential of this, this type of, of instruments for homicide and all other crimes reduction. And I think they, they feel really, really demoralized. Mm -hmm. About uh, the political incentive, I think that the president is taking all the responsibility regarding public security. And I think that governors and mayors are not going to be motivated. The, the president is taking the responsibility, and it is really matched with our dysfunctional federalism and with a, a very dysfunctional uh, a fiscal arrangement uh, between federal uh, government and, and state and, and local governments. And I think if, if we want to, to arrange the, the governance structure created for for security issues, we have to arrange this fiscal uh, the fiscal pact. And about Jaime's question, I, I agree with you. I think that there are a lot of a, a policy community working on uh, on security issues, and 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 I think we have counter proposals, but are quite fragmented. And I think we need to create a really policy com a community in order to present an alternative, because we are we are defending what we don't want, but we are not presenting what we, in a very articulate way, what we really want. Thank you, Edna. Enrique. Yes, thank you. Very quickly, regarding community policing, you know. This is not uh, exclusive to Mexico. I think this is this is true all across Latin America. For me, when I have have been in touch with uh, community policing folks uh, in the region, it's a matter of pedigree. Uh, it's a matter of recruitment. Basically, you know, the way it was sold. I don't know when this happened, but the way it was sold at the beginning of you know introducing community policing, uh, somewhat it was divided. It didn't. It was not seen as uh, a, a central piece of doing policing in Mexico or anywhere else. It was introduced as a way to change perceptions. So it's, it's, it's mostly cosmetic. Uh, general, I'm, I'm, make, I'm making a very quick uh, generalization. Uh, sorry about that. I, I think uh, shifting uh, uh, um, the, the concept, I think that the idea of problem-oriented policing is something that is really more at the center of what they want to do and, 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 and you know, uh, kind of uh, reframe the way they recruit for these units and how that is embedded from the recruitment, the training, and then the capacities installed at the local uh, and the incentives for them to, to, to use, uh, to be proactive and use uh, primary policing is it's key. Um, on regards to, to Jaime's uh, comment, uh, for, me, for me, Jaime, the, the, big, the big thing here is to remain focused on the, on the agenda of those who you mentioned, the NGOs, the think tanks, the experts, uh, the, the former officials, if you will. Uh, I think the agenda today is set, the agenda and the discussion of the month is set every day from Palacio Nacional. Uh, uh, if he thinks that we should talk about amnesty for the next you know, 30 days, he just, he just needs to say, let's talk about amnesty, and we discuss amnesty like crazy. If he says, let's discuss the airport, then it becomes the airport. If he th thinks that now we should be the National Guard, we just follow through, right? I think we need, we need to remain focused. That's what I mean. We have to continue pushing, uh, talking to each other. I think uh, more than ever, those around the table and beyond, we need to you know, keep talking to each other, partner in these efforts. And the second piece of this, I think it's very important, is, is remain engaged. Uh, the level of polarization that, that I'm, re I mean, I now live in DC, and, and you know, I, I'm about to quit Twitter. Um, <laughs> it's it's really painful. It's really painful. I, 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 you know, and it's you just start reading, and I'm like, man, I, I, I don't need this. Uh, but and, and 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 I try to, you know, I disengage, and I think rem remain engaged is really important. 
not only in terms of fighting back. Uh, I was very recently with a U.S.-based organization, and I, and I took a great lesson from them. They say, we stay friends with those that we want to change, right? I, th I think civil society in Mexico, uh, we have not done that really well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we have incentives to be combat combative. Uh, as a former official, I can tell you when, when, when an NGO knocked the door and said, hey, I want to collaborate, I think that created more space to really move forward an agenda. Um, I, I think we need to you know, do that much better. On regards of performance-based finance, uh, I, I haven't seen a real uh, um, uh, effort on this sense. I think the previous administration tried to introduce that as a general idea with a performance-based budget and stuff like that uh, that never worked. Uh, I, th I think it would be great. Uh, I, th I think some more organizations like Ethos is, is also already working on with, you know, some experiments trying to uh, work with pay for success measures and stuff like that. But I'm not super familiar with, 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 uh, with these efforts, uh, so, so I cannot answer that in, in detail. Thank you, Enrique. Ambassador Wayne? J just a couple of comments. One, the discussion about training just shows how complicated um, this is when you look at the professionalization of a law enforcement force and the training that's going to have to take place with this National Guard if it goes forward. We don't really know if they're going to have different divisions in the National Guard, for example. You could have different kind of training for different parts of that natu natural National Guard to address some of these community issues, but also some of the intelligence issues. If you've been working as, as you have, you know that the law enforcement is really bad about intelligence collection in Mexico. Their intelligence collection used to amount to bringing somebody in, tying them in a chair, and then they admitted to their crime uh, after being persuaded to do so. That had to change with the new judicial system, but they haven't really learned the ways to collect evidence to or to collect intelligence ahead of time. So this is all part of a big continuum that is very complicated and needs to be developed. And I could, you know, to be positive, I could see it being developed in this new institution if there was careful engagement, which comes to that last point. I think it is really important to be open to that kind of engagement. I don't think the big public meetings where you get together in front of all the television and you have all the governors there and some civil society and other people are very useful at all except to make some symbolic statements. But I can foresee great utility to having s smaller public-private discussions about how is this going, what have we missed, what are we doing, and doing that regularly over time, that could be a big value added to the new authorities. Good. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate the conversation, your insights. Thank you all for your great questions. We're going to take a brief break. I'd really like to get the next panel started on the hour, um, which makes about eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> please grab a coffee, chat quickly, run to the bathroom, but come right back. We're going to try to get started uh, right at 11 o'clock. Thank you all. <laughs>